Hello and welcome. It's been a good week for the world's most powerful woman, the EU chief Ursula von der Leyen, moving a step closer to winning another five year term. We've done a lot of things right together in the last five years. The track record shows that. And this is why I'm running for another term at the helm of the European Commission. It's been a week of raised hopes for a temporary ceasefire in Gaza, which came to nothing and saw increasing US frustration with Israel. Homes destroyed, neighbors in rubble, cities in ruin, families without food, water, medicine. It's heartbreaking. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire. And it's been an historic week here in France, becoming the first country in the world to explicitly include the right to abortion in its constitution. President Macron wants his European neighbors to follow suit. Today is not the end of a story. It is the beginning of a struggle. We will fight this battle on our continent, in our Europe. I'm Gavin Lee. Welcome to The World This Week. With me in the studio to discuss the events of the last seven days, Celestine Bolan, independent journalist, formerly of the New York Times okay. Moscow correspondent. Uh, Celestine, we'll start with you. Just Is there something this week that's particularly caught your eye? Well, I've been really interested in the debate, I mean, in the statements by uh, Macron, president of France, about uh, drawing a red line, um, basically saying... Uh, saying there are no red lines and that troops in the soil, on the ground in Ukraine is possible. Um, that prompted a reaction from the Germans in particular, who stated, yes, there is a red line and that's it. Um, and I just think it's a very interesting diplomatic debate in terms of what's possible to discuss, even though it's being discussed privately when you say it publicly. And does that help uh, the situation by maybe raising escalating one step further. So I thought it was it's a very interesting debate. Yeah, the back the backstory of the geopolitics going on between Russia and France. Right. Uh, let me also bring in Matthew Dalton, Wall Street general reporter covering France and Europe. Let's just bring up an image a second. Time magazine covering one of your colleagues on its front page. This is the cover at the moment of this week's edition covering uh, the story of Evan Gershkovitz, imprisoned in Russia for almost 12 months on espionage charges, widely considered to be a political pawn, human bargaining chip for President Putin. Um, do we know, Matthew, how he is at the moment? Well, he's in good health. Um, that we know. Uh, you know, he's, um, he's been in prison for almost a year, so I think his, he's keeping his spirits up. Um, you know, we're... Biden administration and and with you know of course and we're following this very closely is uh, negotiating for his release and um, Vladimir Putin said that that they are negotiating you know they're responding to those negotiations he um, has indicated that uh, he wants um, a Russian assassin who has now been who's been imprisoned in Germany uh, to be released um, in exchange for Evan. And of course, um, that kinds of that's a kind of triangular negotiation uh, that that complicates things because uh, you know, Evan is not a German citizen and he was, doesn't work for a German newspaper. So um, you know, the, the Germans may uh, you know, have some that that just complicates some matters. And uh, you know, you, you probably saw that um, when uh, Alexei Navalny died, uh, his widow said that um, he was about to be released as part of a uh, trade that would involve um, uh, Evan and this German assassin, and that uh, the that Putin basically had him killed. Uh, Navalny killed um, before. A, a, a before that before he could be, be released. So um, that that's what's happening right now. And of course, uh, it looks like he's going to be in in prison for a year. And um, the the you know it's also worth mentioning that there's another American journalist who worked for Radio Free. Um, Europe, who is, is also in, in prison, and, and she's um, there on the same uh, ridiculous, same kinds of ridiculous sure. charges that uh, Evan has been charged with. Matthew Celestine, good to have you with us. We're across to Brussels as well, bringing Beatrice Navarro, 300 kilometres away, a former Washington correspondent, now Brussels correspondent for the Spanish newspaper La Vanguardia. Beatrice, you followed the Trump years the first time round. Now in the heart of Europe, you're just back from Bucharest. The crowning of Ursula von der Leyen is the nomination for their next uh, European Commission president. Also the author of this, 
This is, we're about to see the book of Dolly Parton, <laughs> and not just any book, this is an American portrait, un retrato americano. You take us on a journey. You ask, what does Dolly tell us about the US? Hello, good evening, Gavin. Pleasure to be with you this evening, and thank you so much for mentioning Dolly Parton. I think it's really fitting today in International Women's Day to vindicate Dolly Parton, a woman, a woman who was really underestimated in spite of her talents and of her contribu contributions to the American culture and society, just as many women experience in their daily lives. So I think it's a, it's really fitting. And well, it was a pleasure to uh, to go uh, to travel through her life, through her career, and to discover how she connects uh, with the American history and actually with the current political battles that uh, are. Uh, setting apart the Americans nowadays. So thanks for mentioning. No problem. If any English publishers are watching, uh, Beatrice, I know you're still looking for an English publisher for your Spanish work. Let's also bring in Eric Randolph, a culture editor of AFP, Agence France Press. Oscar weekend, the razzle dazzle of all events. And I know from your Instagram, you've been hobnobbing with some of the stars. Tell us about what's been happening here. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, the nice thing about AFP is you can have some very uh, sudden and uh, total career changes. I was in uh, Tehran and Istanbul beforehand and now I'm the culture correspondent so I managed to uh, give up uh, all the, the horrible Middle Eastern politics for a couple of years and uh, rub shoulders, as you say, with uh, Bradley Cooper and uh, Kerry Mulligan when they were promoting Maestro. And for my money, uh, Bradley deserves the Oscar uh, the next weekend, but um, maybe that's just because he was nice to me and let me have a selfie with him. Great to have you all with us. Well, the week began with high hopes for a 40-day ceasefire in Gaza to be in place by the weekend before the start of the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Initial talks began here in Paris. They moved to Cairo with Qatari and Egyptian mediators involved. Hamas were represented. Israel didn't send a delegation. Wanting clear answers on how many hostages are still alive, they say they were kept informed. But as the days progressed, it's clear the talks haven't. Hamas delegation left. What about the plight? Not only the hostages, but a displaced population unable to leave and facing starvation, according to the UN. The US today saying it's building a makeshift pier to bring in aid. The EU getting involved to provide a humanitarian corridor by sea. Let's have a listen to what President Biden had to say. Israel also has a fundamental responsibility, though, to protect innocent civilians in Gaza. <clears throat> More than 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of whom are not Hamas. I've been working nonstop to establish an immediate ceasefire that would last for six weeks to get all the prisoners released, all the hostages released, to get the hostages home and ease the intolerable humanitarian crisis and build toward an enduring, a more, something more enduring Matthew Dalton, no ceasefire. It seems little consolation at the moment that there is this, this peer being set up with, with EU support. What's your sense of what that means on the ground right now? Well, it's a question of how much aid can get in through this peer. Um, you know, there's most of the deliveries have, have been are supposed to be going in through land. Um, that has been held up by, by all kinds of uh, bureaucratic and, and security obstacles that, that the Israelis, among others, have thrown up. Um, so the, the Biden administration in the U.S. has been airdropping supplies, but that volume is nowhere near enough to, to compensate for what should be coming in through land. Um, it's a question of how quickly um, this, these kind of seaborne deliveries can be delivered uh, into actually and actually reach the population in Gaza. Um, you know, the, the Israelis are going to be screening these shipments when they leave Cyprus. Um, how vigorous are these screens going to be? How um, much will these, these security checks slow down the flow of aid by sea? Uh, so there are all these questions um, that are, uh, that loom over this operation, which um, is very complicated, but you know, the, the US military, if there's any organization in the world that can do it quickly, it's, it's that one. Celestine, I saw, well, we watched President Biden there, frustration clear, increasing frustration over months. Right. Is Israel listening to any of its allies? Well, I, I mean, honestly, I think they've got their own, I mean, Netanyahu, to be precise, has his own course set in his mind, and he's pursuing it. I was interested by the visit this week of Gantz to the UK to meet with Cameron, 
which is, is the opposition leader, part of the coalition right, the cabinet at the moment, for the right. war cabinet, Benny Gantz, went first to the US, then to the UK. Right, right. And apparently without the uh, accord of Netanyahu and without the sort of diplomatic, you know, officially the foreign ministry behind him. So that's interesting in terms of a little bit of light among the war cabinet, uh, between members of the war cabinet. Um, yes, because this was a freelance visit, there hasn't been an invitation for Benjamin Netanyahu, much right. as we're told his outrage about this, but the sense that things could be shifting given that there's the personal say-so from right. President Biden for Kamala Harris to meet him. Right. And then also, I mean, the fact is, polls seem to show that Gantz has a, would have a lead if there were to be an election, which, of course, there's not any sign of that coming soon. But still, I mean, maybe there's a little bit of a shift. I mean, maybe Netanyahu has to have a rethink. I was just going to say one thing about the... Um, the aid pier or whatever it is they're building. I mean, it reminds us of Mulberry Harbors outside of on World War II, the D-Day the 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 beaches, which yeah. actually, when you think about it, they threw it up over one night. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this one shouldn't be too complicated. If... And they're still there, some of them, aren't they? Yeah. Let's also bring in Beatrice, because interesting take today, Ursula von der Leyen announcing that there'll be this humanitarian maritime corridor. Beatrice, what, what have you been hearing about that? Well, um, we learned about this visit just, uh, I believe, yesterday or the day before yesterday, while um, Madame von der Leyen was in um, Bucharest during the EPP um, Congress. And, well, actually, they haven't been given a lot of technical details about how this maritime corridor will actually work. They've been heading us to the Cyprus authorities. So... Um, um, there's no much, actually, there's no much communication going on from here. What I can say is that it's striking how the EU, the only thing they can do is really to focus on mitigation measures because, you know, the um, Palestinian-Israeli Palestinian conflict is the most dividing issue in foreign affairs for the EU member states. And the, the threshold for an agreement, the common position they are able to reach is kind of very low. And uh, I mean, they barely, member states have barely been capable of agreeing in asking for uh, humanitarian policies in plural. So, yeah, they, I mean, in spite of uh, the very uh, precarious humanitarian situation on the ground, the position of the EU is kind of soft still and really limited to mitigation measures more than requesting, I mean, with uh, force and strength to both parts to sit on the table and, and to stop the violence. That's really interesting, limited to mitigation measures. Beatrice Eric, um, formerly Tehran correspondent, let's look at the other side of the coin here, Hamas, backed by Iran, the so-called axis of resistance it calls itself, been elections there in Iran. Could anything change off the back of that? Off the back of elections in Iran? Uh, Where no. there was a low turnout, <laughs> but the hardliners yeah. won again. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Iran, I mean, the story out of the Iran elections is that there does seem to have been, uh, there are indications that there were a huge number of uh, spoiled ballots uh, that were a protest vote. Uh, this is coming after the, uh, a year or more of protests uh, led by women. Uh, and um, the, there's a very low turnout, a historically low turnout, but that's been a long-term trend for a long time. And the, the forces in Iran that control the country, the IRGC, the Supreme Leader, have gone all in on a strategy of maintaining full hardline control, sidelining anybody moderates, let alone reformists, let alone anybody who is in any way challenging uh, the status quo over there. And they've been highly effective at doing so. And so I see no chance of, of any change in Iran. Not that that necessarily plays directly into what we're talking about with, with Gaza. You know, obviously, Iran has close links with Hamas. But I think uh, Iran is taking any benefits that it can from this conflict. But I don't think it's directly involved in any way that can have a game-changing impact on what's happening on the ground in that war at the moment. Well, from Gaza to the situation in the US, Super Tuesday. Let me paint the picture of the scene in Donald Trump's ballroom in Mar-a-Lago Tuesday night. After his Republican win on Super Tuesday, there was a victory party, pizza slices, soft drinks between the gilded columns and the deep velvet curtains. Over the top, Chinsey, his critics say. The guests gathered at 4 p.m. He didn't appear for another six hours, according to guests. Nikki Haley dropped out as his only significant rival by then. And his victory speech, it was a familiar theme. And now we have a very divided country. We have a country that a political person uses weaponization against 
His political opponent never happened here. It happens in other countries, but they're third world countries. And in some ways, we're a third world country. So the results for both Republicans and Democrats take us a step closer to Biden versus Trump 2.0. And on Thursday night's annual State of the Union address, President Biden gave less of a picture of a nation coming together and more of a campaign speech repeatedly on the attack with warnings about Donald Trump, who he referred to as only his predecessor did so 13 times. Now my predecessor, a former Republican president tells Putin, quote, do whatever the hell you want. That's a quote. A former president actually said that my predecessor and some of you here seek to bury the truth about January 6th. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. Reasons to be excited, not according to a CBS poll this week. Two thirds says it makes them feel frustrated to have a choice between the same two men again. Eric, how would you sum up the prospect of Trump Biden 2.0? I think if it's the, you know, greatest democracy in the world, and this is the pinnacle of what we've achieved in our politics on this planet, the fact that these two men are the only two choices, the best two people they could possibly find in the whole of America to stand again for election is a sorry state of affairs. But um, I think it's just going to lead to an enormous amount of apathy uh, on voters' part, desperation voting. It just feels... Like, nobody's really going to come out of this particularly happy with the next, uh, with the next four years. Europeans anxious in case of a Trump victory. NATO leaders anxious too. Beatrice, you followed the Trump and Biden years in Washington. How are you feeling about a, a second go? Well, I can just think of all those many voters I talked to during the 2020 campaign, which went to the polls, just really holding their noses and decided to support Joe Biden because of the need to stop Donald Trump from, a second, from having a second term in the White House. Um, so of course, they found that he was not a very good candidate already at the time. I, I think that some of those people, maybe this year, maybe they will go still to the polls and hold their noses and vote for, uh, for Biden in order to stop Trump. But I guess some people will simply stay home. Uh, and we, we cannot forget that in 2020, the turnout was, was really impressive. There was a heavy mobilization from both sides, from the Trump side and from Biden side. And I think that will be very, very difficult to repeat. I fully agree with, with Eric that the apathy uh, will definitely be a, a factor in this, in this election. And, and I think, um, I mean, the, the polls are very clear on what people think about uh, both candidates. Um, most part of the Americans, they do not think that they have the best candidates possible. I think both are actually kind of very lousy candidates. The thing is, who will be the less lousy of the two? And he's the one who may win, I think. I think you make a good point. Money talks as well in the US and to get you on the ticket, a huge amount of money in the first place to get you uh, on the agenda. Celestine, have a listen to this. This is Nikki Haley. Uh, when she stood down, she gave a very interesting speech, not quite committing to supporting Donald Trump. Margaret Thatcher provided some good advice when she said, quote, never just follow the crowd. Always make up your own mind. It is now up to Donald Trump to earn the votes of those in our party and beyond it who did not support him. And I hope he does that. I'm interested in your thoughts here because Donald Trump has called Nikki Haley bird brain useless. Does he continue that strategy? Does he try to win over her voters and try to be nice to her like he's done to previous uh, nominees? I mean, I think he, um, I, I don't see a coming together of those two. So I don't see her bending to him or him looking for her to join. Um, I think that he's got his base and that's where he draws his energy. I think that at the end there is a problem for him because his base is not a majority of the voters, according to the polls. Even if they're discouraging about Biden, they're not all that you know convinced about Trump either. There's a lot of ground for him to gain. And frankly, there's also ground that Biden can pick up. I mean, that's not the right metaphor, but I mean that he can gain ground because I'm a little bit in disagreement with Beatrice because I think he's actually been a good president. I mean, if you look at the things that have actually been accomplished, um, and I'm not talking about foreign policy, which is not his fault. I mean, that he's ended up with this sort of nightmare scenarios in Ukraine and in Israel and Gaza. 
But I mean, the fact of the matter is he's moved forward on some healthcare issues. He's actually improved public transit. I mean, I feel like this is something that, you know, nobody talks about, but frankly, you know, it should be. And thirdly, let's not forget the economy is doing really Just well. Just going to say, what is it, the old Clinton meme back in right. his first term, it's the economy is stupid, his right. campaign team. Right. And ultimately, there has barely been an election, if one at all, that hasn't come down to economy as a top exactly. issue. And, and the fact is that it has been going well, and a lot of it does have to do with some choices that he's made. Um, I think it's I think it's bizarre that people are beginning to acknowledge that the economy isn't as bad as they were saying, but they haven't said and he's and and he's the, gets the credit. I mean, I think there's a disconnect there that's troublesome for him. If I can say, Beatrice, the kind of magnification of everything we're seeing now, it's like the first time round on speed, equally angry, even more so, the gloves are off. I want to know, Beatrice, what would Dolly Parton say? And I say this because she's twice turned down a Medal of Honour from Donald Trump. She says she's a big fan of Taylor Swift, who, according to conspiracy theorists on the right, she's a CIA plant for Joe Biden. Dolly Parton? Taylor Swift. Yeah. Swift enough <laughs> to stay away from all kind of political debates and so uh, many people um, wear t-shirts saying like Dolly Parton for president this is couldn't be more far away from uh, from reality it's interesting to see the parallelisms between Taylor Swift and and Dolly Parton in, in political political terms but we cannot forget that Taylor Swift has been very vocal in, in her uh, democratic uh, positions and Dolly Parton is kind of a mystery. She always ends up, I think, on the right side of history, but uh, we actually do not know who she votes. Anyway, and picking up on, on Celestine, I, I wasn't judging um, Biden's presidency. I couldn't, I couldn't do that and so fast. I was judging the candidates. And as you were saying, actually, the economy is doing very well. And if you see the numbers, the macroeconomic numbers are, are really very good and peak in terms of employment and so on. But it's a fact that uh, President Biden is not able to transfer, to transmit this, uh, his achievements to his voters. And um, I mean, I was on the campaign trail. I, I saw people who were completely not very motivated by Biden himself as a candidate. And that's why I think um, the, the, the Democratic Party could have made a better choice for a candidate. But it's a fact. Biden promised to, to win Trump, and he did. So he, may, he deserves uh, this credit to, to try again. A notable theme which takes us elsewhere is that uh, the issue of abortion, the uh, moving away of the uh, Roe versus Wade, the erosion, as Joe Biden called it, said he wants to bring it back. Um, that's not something that Donald Trump talks about. He knows it's not going down well with many voters. Here in Paris, there was dancing in the streets this week, celebrations in front of the Eiffel Tower, which was lit up with the message, my body, my choice. Let's take a look at what's been going on. Well, these were the scenes today, a ceremony marking a historic moment with France becoming the first country in the world to explicitly enshrine in its constitution the right to abortion. Today, on International Women's Day, there's a special public ceremony taking place. President Macron saying it sends a universal message. Today is not the end of a story. It is the beginning of a struggle. We will fight this battle on our continent, in our Europe. This is why I want to see the guaranteed freedom to terminate a pregnancy enshrined in the European Union's Charter of Fundamental Rights. Interesting, though, the right-wing opposition leader Marine Le Pen claiming it's nothing more than a political stunt. Nothing changes. That's the point they make. It remains, as before, legal to have an abortion up to 14 weeks of pregnancy. The move is purely symbolic. Celestine, let's start with you. What's your take on this? Well, I mean, since we've um, talked about the US and Europe, I can't help but see this as a reflection on the United States, which just stands out. Um, starkly as a kind of an exception to what is the Western world's acceptance of something that women consider a right, their choice to do what they want with their body. And it's not just the abortion. I mean, I was just thinking this week or last week, or at least recently, that, um, you know, France celebrated Robert Ballantère, who is the author of the law against the death penalty, there would never be such honor paid to somebody in the United States who had, you know, put that kind of legislation through. So all of a sudden we see this country 
which was a bastion of many ideals for many people, suddenly stepping aside from history, I'd say. I mean, yeah. and that's, that's a sad thing, you know, and I think, I think that Macron, that was not far from his thoughts, that it sort of sets Europe, and I mean, France in particular, and perhaps Europe aside from the United States is... Uh, Robert Badinter putting an end to the, the guillotine right. and the right. death penalty here in France. Uh, Beatrice, the issue there, interesting for Manuel Macron, saying he wants this to spread to his neighbours. This be an EU right. What chance does he have of that? Well, I think um, I do agree that symbols matter, really. They do matter. But um, his aim to enshrine this, uh, this freedom uh, to abortion in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union is an extremely difficult objective to reach because uh, there is no an unanimous position about abortion in Europe. There is uh, certainly uh, a general acceptance of that right with, with different accents depending on the country. But in Poland, they have an extremely restrictive law and, uh, and, and Malta, um, even, I mean, Malta even uh, um, refrains women from having abortions even when their health is in, uh, is in danger. So, I mean, it's a, it's a political objective, it's a respectable objective, but uh, uh, I don't think it has any chance to become a, a reality. Again, I think uh, Macron tries to, to work on the, to play on the symbols and to position himself against other, maybe other forces around, around the world who have other views about, uh, about basic and fundamental rights. A quixotic mission then, perhaps, for Emmanuel Macron. Eric, can you see the point of uh, the likes of Marine Le Pen saying this is a political stunt, that nothing really changes? Uh, well, she has to say something vaguely negative about anything that Macron does, obviously. As we uh, head towards the European elections? Yes, exactly, and, and the presidential election in, in a few years. Um, uh, but I think Macron knows that he's acting against... Um, not necessarily Marine Le Pen's personal views on abortion, but certainly the right-wing Catholic uh, section of French society that is opposed to abortion. We've had some pro-abortion rallies uh, here in Paris in the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so um, Macron knows that he's playing a bit of a political game against that group and trying to undercut them. And he's seeing that France is heading for similar sorts of divisions as the ones that we've seen in America and how well the American right have played this issue into becoming such a wedge issue. And he's kind of taking it off the table by sticking it in the Constitution. Um, uh, that said, um, abortion is just one part of women's rights. Um, you need to change a lot of things about society around abortion um, to, to, to give it meaning. The fact that we need abortions is because society isn't structured to support women um, if they have a child and they want to continue their career. And so there's a lot of other issues that need to be dealt with around that. Uh, and this is more politics and symbols than... Than, than true substance. Matthew, it's interesting because Beatrice was talking about the ebbing away of rights in the likes of Poland, Hungary, Malta too. Did you get a sense of Emmanuel Macron trying to smoke out the opposition here ahead of elections to see where they were standing, if they were going to oppose abortion on this, which to all ends and purposes, most of the Semblement National, National Rally, they went and agreed with it? Yeah, I mean, they, maybe he was trying to see if they would take the bait and, and, and oppose it um, simply because he proposed it. Uh, but they, they, I think they were largely smart enough not to do that. Um, strong majorities of the French public support this. Um, and it's, it's interesting, though, though, that there is a strong, still, a strong Catholic vote in France. Um, there, there's still, it's a minority, I would say, but it's still there. Uh, but I think he senses the politics of this. Um, you know, he was inspired by uh, to do this, to propose this, because of what happened in the U.S., because the, of the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And you look at what's happening in the U.S. now, um, the, the, that Supreme Court decision was a big factor in the, the midterm elections and the reasons why the, the Democrats actually performed unexpectedly well. Um, abortion was a huge issue across all of the, the, um, the legislative races. And so, you know, I think Macron is, is probably looking at that now and, and thinking, well, um, I think the politics are on my side. Um, as they are probably in many countries across across Europe, maybe not all of them, but most of them.
Which takes us neatly to potentially this week's winner. Good day, certainly, in the last 24 hours for, according to Forbes magazine, the most powerful woman in the world, Ursula von der Leyen, who took a step closer to being given a second term of EU Commission President. She has been put forward as the chosen candidate by her political party in Europe, the EPP, at a summit of centre-right leaders in Bucharest. Let's hear what she had to say. I think we've done a lot of things right together in the last five years. The track record shows that. Europe has stood its ground under most difficult circumstances. And this is why I'm running for another term at the helm of the European Commission. Well, VDL, as she's known in the Brussels bubble and also as a political shapeshifter, notably took office and residence in the 13th floor of the EU Commission when she took up office five years ago. Her first term dominated by war in Europe and in Gaza, a Green Deal that's been weakened in the face of farmers' protests and trying to fend off increasing popularity of the far right. Beatrice, let's start with you. You're just back from that summit. Set the scene for us. The crowning of Ursula is potentially a new term. Yes, indeed. We've uh, I just uh, arrived from Bucharest this morning, and what we have witnessed in the Romanian capital is really the coronation of uh, um, von der Leyen as the APP candidate to lead the next uh, European Commission. I think this is one of the first. There were there are three, four steps that she will have to take. This is one of the easiest ones. She won the vote of the APP by uh, 400 votes against uh, 89. And well, um, she didn't have like excellent relations with her political family uh, for uh, during the last years. Actually, it was very clear during the last 12 months that uh, her political family did not agree with the way she was dealing with the Green Deal. So there have been some tensions. So in order to get to Bucharest yesterday and to, to be there and to be proclamated as the candidate, she really had to agree with the manifesto, which in many respects represents a departure uh, from what she has been advocating for during her current term, for instance, in the terms of the of the Green Deal, even in migration policy, because now the EPP is uh, proposing to test some kind of um, the Rwanda model that was discussed uh, in the UK a couple of years ago, so to externalise uh, the management of the right to asylum, for instance. So she had to agree on all this manifesto in order to be elected uh, the, the, the candidate. So the next step will be also an easy one, um, the APP is expected to win the elections to the European Parliament in June and a couple of weeks later, the European Council, the leaders of the 27 member states will gather together and normally she will be the chosen one to, to, to head the next European Commission. And then is when we get to the third and most difficult uh, uh, test that will be the vote in the European Parliament where actually they turn to the right of the APP and also the fact that they are open to make alliances with some extreme right parties actually uh, may put her in danger because she may not have enough votes from the left. Very interesting. I remember standing with you for the first time round in Brussels in the Justice Lipsis building where suddenly she came out of nowhere. Nobody knew who she was, really. Defence Minister from Germany. Nobody was sure. Was it van der Leyen, van der Leyen? How do you pronounce it? So it, there could still be a mystery. It comes down to European Council leaders too, doesn't it, Beatrice? Matthew, rating uh, von der Leyen for the last five years, how do you think she scores? Well, she certainly had an eventful... Uh, five years. You've had COVID, you've had uh, the war in Ukraine, um, and now the, the war in Gaza, um, less less important for Europe. But um, those have been, you know, two major tests. And I think, you know, with COVID, she, the European Commission did a lot in terms of stepping in to negotiate the purchase of vaccines, for example. I'd, you know, she was criticized early on for that. But I think in the end, the, um, the European Commission's role um, that, that you know, she did a she did quite a good job um, with Ukraine. Uh, she, you, Europe has been united uh, largely, um, uh, you know, maybe except for uh, Orban, but uh, even he's been brought on board to a very strong response to the Russian invasion, much stronger, I think, than people thought Europe was going to muster when it happened. Uh, really strong sanctions against uh, the the Russian economy. Um, really supplying very large amounts of weapons to the Ukrainian military, um, crossing all kinds of red lines that, the, you know, in, in the beginning, they people thought they weren't going to cross. So th she she's played a role in all those things. On the other side, you, you can always wonder, well, how important is she really? Um, in Europe, it's the heads of state that kind of run the show. And in particular, it's the heads of France and Germany and to a less extent Italy and the Netherlands. Um, they, you know, when they decide to do something, 
that's kind of what happens and the commission has to go along to, to a large extent in many areas. So uh, she's been, she's, I think, done a good job, um, but is she the most uh, powerful woman in the world? Um, I don't know about that. According to Forbes, she <laughs> is. Head of Swift number five. <laughs> Celestine, let me get your sense. Is she worth 26,000 uh, euros a month for the job? Has she been a force for good for the last five years? Yeah. I, I never knew her budget, so... According to the EU official website okay. on the Commission, right. 24,000, 26,000... how does that compare to other... I don't know. Um, I a think... little bit more than the British Prime Minister, for oh, example. Really? Yes, I think the Bulgarian Prime Minister is on the lowest in Europe, 30,000, I think, a year. The okay. Commission pays well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's, I mean, obviously that sort of European bureaucracy is something that many people in Europe complain about and the fact that it costs money and maybe too much money might be part of, might fuel that debate. I, but I mean, on her personal um, leadership, I think on Ukraine, she has been good. She's been consistent. Uh, she's been clear. Um, and she's been out there. She's gone at least, I don't know how many times, but anyway. I have to say the other thing I find extraordinary is that she's the mother of seven children. <laughs> And she looks fantastic, but that's obviously not what we're supposed to be talking about. But I mean, the fact is that she is a good representative of a Europe that we're all proud of. So, I mean, I, I, I don't see too many negatives. Of, I mean, I don't really. This takes us on to, we'll come to you on this one, especially Eric in a second, because we are 20 weeks to go until the start of the Paris Olympics. Last week, President Macron saying he'd swim in the River Seine to prove it is clean enough for the Games. He didn't say, though, when. This week, the official Olympics and Paralympics posters were unveiled. Uh, it was the French artist Hugo Gattoni. It's an art deco tape on the landscape of the capital. AI free zone, we're told, nothing digitally enhanced. 2,000 hours this took to create. Let's take a look at it. There's controversy, Eric, the far right opposition saying, saying it's too woke. There's no symbols of Christianity on the buildings. The French trickler flag is not there. Well, <laughs> what's your take on this? Do you like it? Um... It's unexpected, the pink <laughs> Eiffel Tower. Uh, That's a kind interesting... of question, if you get a birthday present, you don't want to hear that. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, no, I know, you know, it's growing on me. It took me a little bit by surprise. Um, I do find it funny how it's the, it's the right-wing anti-woke brigade that seem to get so triggered by everything these days. They can't see it. Almost anything can get them very riled up, and they're the ones who used to laugh at the snowflakes on the left who uh, used to get so upset about everything. Um, yes, they're very upset that there isn't a French flag and that there isn't a cross, a Christian cross on Anvalide, uh, apparently. And so they must have been combing over this with a magnifying glass to try and find thinking, something I, to upset them. I was uh, thinking... Uh, yeah, I it was sort it. of like, where's Waldo? You know, yeah. like, where's the French? Great Waldo? magnifying glass. It does bring that up, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, and maybe you'd, it's there, by the way. Yeah, you'd have no idea it's France otherwise without the French flag. There's only yeah. the it's very true. Tower yeah, yeah, right yeah. In, the yeah. <laughs> in the middle of the Saint Denis Stadium. Um, right, right, Beatrice, right, right. what's uh, Wes Wally in Spanish? Donde esta que Waldo? <laughs> Waldo. Donde esta Wally? Wally. Okay. okay, and what's your take on this? Would you pay twenty Waldo. euros a poster? Uh, I don't think so, to be honest. Uh, I haven't seen the poster. I've been really in my European, happy European bubble for the whole week. And I, I was very surprised to find about this debate, as Eric mentioned, how people can get so upset about certain things. But I was also surprised by the design. Normally in a poster, um, kind of less is more, you know, it's supposed to be something iconic. And I don't see that in this design, which is it's beautiful. I just don't really see it like for an Olympic Games. Uh, Commemoration. Well, let me put forward Hugo Gattoni's point of view. It is a landscape take on the capital, Art Deco style. You see the Olympic flame arriving on a three-mast ship from Marseille. We have high rolling waves representing the surfing in Tahiti. Eiffel Tower piercing through the Stade de France. Spectators sprinkled throughout, going back to Celestine's Where's Wally theme. Matthew, do you think there should be um, symbols like the trickle of flag, perhaps, that would appease the far right? Or is this just pre-EU election campaigning? Yeah, I think option B. <laughs> 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 I think, uh, I mean, yeah, as I said before, it's very clear that this is in Paris. Uh, you don't need, you know, the French flag along with it. You know, and also it's like, um, 
this is the Olympic. It's, it's, it's for the entire world. So maybe you don't want to have like the huge flag or, or any flag of the host country. I mean, everybody knows where it is. Um, you know, I, I, I do wonder if, if he was thinking about these things, the artist was thinking about these things when he was designing it, or if it's just kind of, you know, you can't think of everything when you, when you create a work of art or a poster like this. So, um, Give the guy a break. Maybe. I think that's his, <laughs> if you look at previous works by Ugo, that is his style. It's in keeping with everything else. There's nothing suddenly uh, missing out on that. Mm. Interesting as well this week, just to mention, Depeche Mode have been playing in Paris. Two concerts, ordinary you say, except for the fact that the surveillance system for the Paris Olympics has been tested in there for the first time, where if there's any AI movements or disturbances, they're going to monitor how that would work in the game. So... Little known fact about Dispatch Mode. Maybe the fans oh. didn't know either. All tickets. of you, <laughs> thank you for your time. Thank Eric you. uh, from the uh, AP, from AFP, the culture editor. We've also got Celestine Boulet, independent journalist, formerly New York Times correspondent in Moscow. Uh, Matthew Dalton as well uh, with the Wall Street Journal here in Paris and Europe. And Beatrice Navarro on Skype for the correspondent for La Vanguardia. Thank you for taking your time in Brussels. That's it for the time being. We'll be back next week with more The World This Week. As the world marks International Women's Day, the 51% continues to cover the campaign for gender equity. Not just one day a year, but every week. Join Annette Young as she reports on the women who are reshaping our world. On the world. Liberté, égalité, actualité. 20 years on, the Madrid attacks remain traumatic. We can't get it out of our minds. It happened to us. For the victims and their loved ones. The authorities keep asking us for new documents as if they didn't trust us. But also for an entire nation that does not want to forget. We need to learn about this case because if we don't want to commit the same errors in the future, we need to know how to react. We adapted to the times to prevent attacks. That was our goal. The 2004 Madrid train attacks revisited on France 24 and France24.com. Follow our international journalist on France 24. Douglas Herbert, Angela Diffley, Robert Parsons, Philip Turl, and Armand Georgian. From the newsroom to the studio or live on air, they are on standby 24-7 to analyze world events. Whether tackling historic, geopolitical, economic, or environmental issues, our experts get to the heart of the biggest international news stories. They contribute to our special reports and scour the headlines for information. Follow it live. Follow the news. Follow France 24. Liberté, égalité, actualité.